Can you get to know an artist only through their work? This is the question that drives Davy Reardon's video game, The Beginner's Guide. The game's main inquiry question is probably most directly stated in its trailer. Let's say you sit down at a stranger's computer. You start opening up files and looking through stuff, and eventually you come to a folder that just says, my work, and now try to imagine, without ever having met this person, who they are. The Beginner's Guide is a narrative video game released in fall 2015. According to the game's official website, it lasts about an hour and a half and has no traditional mechanics, no goals or objectives. Instead, it tells the story of a single person trying to deal with something that they do not understand. It was created, directed, designed, and written by Raiden, and it was released under the studio name Everything Unlimited Limited. Raiden narrates the game, telling the player that the game is about a collection of video games made between 2008 and 2011 by a developer named Coda. I'm going to refer to Raiden's in-game presence as the narrator from now on, because his role is written and scripted to be part of the game's story. The narrator tells us that despite only meeting Coda a few times, his work was very inspirational to him. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. Now these games mean a lot to me. Uh, I met Coda in early 2009, at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff, and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. I found it to be a good reference point for the kinds of creative works that I wanted to make. The narrator explains that he was worried about Coda because he assumed that the creator was troubled and reclusive, providing analysis of Coda's games to justify this opinion. Seeing this game at the time that he made it, it looked really unhealthy to me. I was watching him do this to himself, and I hated it. I hated seeing him so trapped. The narrator states that he had to share Coda's work without his consent because it needed to be seen by others so Coda could develop some self-confidence. Sharing without consent is one thing, but the narrator also took it upon himself to interpret and even add to Coda's work changing each level from its intended version in order to make each game more accessible and palatable to the player. You walk down a corridor, you solve a puzzle, you get to the end. Simple enough. All right, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press enter, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. The narrator states, art gives you access to the creator. But is this true? Well, no, not really. The whole experience of the game goes on to show you that art does not give you access to the creator. How can it? The narrator interprets Coda's games incorrectly, positing that he's crying out for attention and seeking external validation for his work when it turns out that this really wasn't the case at all, and the narrator was actually assuming things based on his own experience and point of view. I guess if someone had told me ahead of time that he just really enjoyed making prison games, maybe I wouldn't have thought he was so desperate. I wouldn't have told so many people that he was depressed. Maybe he just likes making prisons. At the end of the beginner's guide, Coda creates a game to tell the narrator that he doesn't appreciate the narrator's meddling in his worker process, that he makes what he makes for himself, not the narrator or anyone else. The narrator also discovers that his interpretation of Coda's work says a lot more about him than it does about Coda. <laughs> it's strange, but the thought of not being driven by external validation is unthinkable. Like, I actually cannot conceive of what that would be like. What now? I think I need to go. And I'm sorry, because I know that I said that I would be here and I, and I would walk you through this, but I'm starting to feel like I have a lot of work to do. Okay, so that's a summary of what the Beginner's Guide is about in terms of its narrative and gameplay. 
There's a lot of speculation about the Beginner's Guide in relation to its own creator, though. Did Davey Reardon make this as an autobiographical game? How much of himself did he put into this? Many people think the game could be about how Reardon's life changed after he released his first successful title, The Stanley Parable, in 2013. But The Beginner's Guide, by its very premise, asks us to be careful about this thought. Does The Beginner's Guide give us access to Reardon in some way? What if we played both of Reardon's games? Would we be able to gain an understanding of who he is as a person through his game development choices? What do you think? Let's take it a step further. What if an artist couldn't tell you how they were feeling? And what if your favorite artist could draw or paint, but they otherwise couldn't speak or advocate for themselves? Would you be able to interpret their imagery and understand them as if you had a meaningful conversation? Outsider art is a branch of art that tends to assume that art gives you access to the creator's inner landscape. Simply put, outsider art is produced by self-taught artists who are not part of the artistic establishment. The history of outsiders began in asylums with schizophrenic, autistic, and other mentally ill people making art, but it also applied to those with physical disabilities as well. During the early 20th century, Hans Prinzhorn, a German psychiatrist and art historian, took an interest in the work of his mentally ill patients. He began studying and collecting his patients' artwork with the hope that it would reveal something useful about the inner worlds of those he was trying to help. Until the last century or so, art was seen more as a trade or a craft than a form of self-expression. So this need for raw self-expression by disabled people was quite shocking to viewers at the time. Prince Horn's book, The Artistry of the Mentally Ill, was released in 1922, and it quickly became the foundational text on the topic. It's important to note that Prince Horn's interest wasn't only diagnostic, it was also aesthetically driven. He wanted to stake a claim in art history. His book thoroughly described 10 people that he dubbed the Schizophrenic Masters, documenting their artwork and personal histories. Prince Horn's book became popular with artists in the decade after its release because many were looking for a new, more pure form of art making after the end of World War I. French artist Jean Dubuffet was particularly inspired by this text. He collected art from people and institutions and coined the term raw art, and he fiercely protected this collection and concept, selectively applying the label where he thought it was most appropriate. He reinforced Prince Horn's early findings, that a disabled artist's creative output is strictly segregated from the sophisticated academic world of trained art making. It was something authentic and new. Roger Cardinal, an art historian, translated and built on Du Buffet's ideas since the early 1970s. He coined the term outsider art for English speakers in 1972, and then went on to create more arbitrary designations of who was and wasn't considered an outsider in the decades following. In 2009, he wrote an essay that clarified that autistic people weren't outsider artists because outsider art was about being a visionary, and autistic people produce work that's too formulaic and representational due to the type of disability they have. As I'm going to continue to explain, the whole category and history of outsider art is flawed and based on the assumptions of a few people sharing their interpretations of others' artworks. This branch of art was and is reserved for groups of people that were assumed to be unimportant until they did something that a few historians deemed interesting. After all, these people aren't trained artists, these were idiot savants that miraculously happened to make great art in the opinions of these historians. The name of it, outsider art, is literal in the way that it describes how there are insiders and outsiders in the art world. Outsider art is a big umbrella term, by the way, and it also intends to include or overlap with naive or untrained art, spiritual art, folk art, and children's art. So in addition to the mentally ill and physically disabled, outsider art is also made by the uneducated, the religious, the poor, the rural, the racialized, and actual children. The secret ingredient in all of this is ableism, discrimination against disabled people. But sexism, racism, classism, and ageism certainly play a part too. 
the lines between educated and uneducated artists are blurry, with many educated artists often being described as outsiders because of their approach to art making that's inspired by marginalized people. I'm thinking of artists like Jean Dubuffet, Paul Klee, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Pablo Picasso, among others. Insiders have often benefited from this faux outsider status. So as discussed, this category of art has historically been a real mixed bag for disabled and marginalized artists. As Taya Hurwitz, contributor for Studio Gallery, succinctly wrote, The establishment of outside art as a genre created many opportunities for artists with disabilities, but also raised questions of exploitation and fetishization, as well as the inherent othering of the term. Works by self-taught artists were newly legitimized in the art world, but were falsely labeled as primitive and simply used as inspiration for well-known contemporary artists. Many established artists envied and almost fetishized the way outsider artists employed their natural creativity without artistic input from others, but often ignore the reality of these artists' experiences as marginalized people. While it may seem optimal to provide disabled artists opportunities in niche fields, being categorized as an outsider artist might stifle long-term opportunities, as being labeled an outsider artist still means that the outsider can never be an insider. Theoretically, it gives these artists a platform, but it will never grant them wider recognition beyond this cult status. And considering that the artists cannot be separated from their collectors and advocates, it strips away their autonomy. Similar to the outcomes of racial and gender-based segregation, by narrowing these artists into strict categories or castes, opportunities to participate in the wider cultural context are narrowed. In contrast to all of the expressed concerns, John Mazels, the founder of Raw Art Magazine, justifies his love of outsider art with these sentiments. It's not for sale, and most of it isn't even done to be exhibited. When I came across it, I was so amazed by it. It was so powerful, and it had such a strong personal meaning. People were revealing themselves, their demons, their own aspirations, their inner feelings. You're right inside someone's creative world, and it's an extraordinary experience. They don't go to private exhibitions or private views. They just work. They've got an inner compulsion. That sounds a lot like how the narrator speaks about Coda in the Beginner's Guide, doesn't it? We're told that outsider art is mystical and profound, and we're told that it gains these properties because it's made by marginalized people that are ignorant of their own art making, and they paradoxically know more about art by knowing less about it formally. This artistic label demonstrates the inherent discrimination in art establishment thinking that's lurking just below the surface of what is considered mainstream art. Part of the reason why categories like this one proliferate is because they act as a kind of marketing gimmick in the art market. Capitalism necessitates demand, and thus the role of the capitalist is to take advantage of niche markets when they can. The reason why people may be resistant to change their perspective on ideas relating to the outsider artist is because they've already invested in the market. There is no real integration for disabled, queer, racialized, or poor artists so long as the art market exists as it currently does, because the demand for such a market relies on the othering of these specific group identities. Princehorn, Dubuffet, and Cardinal all made names for themselves by staking their claims in relation to others' work through their interpretations. The artists they categorized and interpreted were vulnerable people that were often unable to advocate for themselves. The flawed writings of these scholars are entangled with the work of generations of disabled and marginalized artists in our books and records, shaping our thoughts and perceptions. In the Beginner's Guide, the narrator tries to stake a claim to Coda's work through his discovery and interpretation of it. By the end of the game, the narrator learns to listen to the artist he was infringing upon, coming to the understanding that his perception of someone else's art was warped by his own need for external validation. The narrator's commentary and the artist's work go their own separate ways.
to fully engage with the idea of insider and outsider artists, it's important to consider any biases that you might hold when looking at a disabled person's work, because what we're told about art shapes our perception of it. Here is a landscape, a cornfield with birds flying out of it. Look at it for a moment in silence. Now supposing I say whilst you look at it, this is the last picture Van Gogh painted before he killed himself. Words you notice consciously. Music is subtler. It can work almost without your noticing it. How often do you consciously notice the music played over paintings on television? Yet music and rhythm change the significance of a picture. Likewise, let's look at the beginner's guide with and without the commentary. And this is where I have trouble saying anything meaningful about Coda's work. Because more than anything else, the tower just feels distant. It feels like it's trying to distance itself from the world. It's a very cold game. Let's keep that in mind as we look at two artworks by two different artists. This is a print created in 2017 by a young person attending an art class. And this is a drawing created by yours truly during my freshman year at university in 2014. While they look radically different at first glance, both these images are of the same person, and they took roughly the same amount of time to produce. We see a much more sporadic and abstract image on the left, presented next to its polar opposite on the right. A rigidly representational drawing in the foreground, with lazily drawn ink splatters in the background to cynically meet specific classroom criteria. Despite lacking a technical skill to fully render a representational face, this person rendered my likeness with striking attention to detail. The artist was able to identify my key facial features through keen observation, similarly to how I drew my own portrait. They incorporated short hair, spirited eyebrows, bags under the eyes, an evenly groomed beard, and my famously monotone expression. Even the oblong shape of the head was no accident, because they were working on a rectangular foam plate, and they opted to maximize the space of the drawing surface. Many children of their age do not have the capacity to consider the use of space on the page, often resulting in small drawings or empty, unused space. Since this image is a print, the artist did not have the means to precisely place colors where desired. They instead creatively blocked out the colors, in broad strokes, using a limited palette. Few colors are used, and the orientation they are placed expresses an understanding of who they are modeling the print after. The blue highlights of the hair, red accentuates the tired eyes, and yellow was used as the Simpsons equivalent of white skin. It's the only artwork I currently hang on my wall. Though the differences in terms of skill between both artists is obvious, the similarities are what make these examples important. Both artists are neurodivergent, both were non-verbal during their childhood, and both have had their proclivities for art making attributed to their disability. In other words, they would be considered savants, which derives from the ableist term idiot savant. Their art making would be considered a compulsion first, and a skill second. Despite the level of education, knowledge, and effort involved, it's the personal qualities of the artists involved that would become the focal point, rather than their technical skills, or what they have to say of their art. To me, the only difference between the anonymous child artist and I that day was that we were at different places in our lives in art education. I was in university while they were in an art lesson. 
The stories that we tell about artists and their artworks matter. There are no insiders or outsiders, there are only people of different ages and skills, making things for their own reasons. We should let them speak for themselves wherever we can, and when they can't, we certainly shouldn't assume. The narrator in the beginner's guide asks us, So if your role here is not to understand, then what is it? I don't know if there's a single correct answer to that question. Being an artist is one role, and being an art viewer is another. Maybe the viewer's role is to embrace and accept that interpretation is inevitable, because the human brain wants to make sense of what it's seeing, and it can only do so in relation to itself. But in a way, interpretation is the act of claiming partial ownership of someone else's work. By interpreting someone's artwork, you're adding new meaning or value, as well as stripping away the author's intentions. Interpretation can be an additive or destructive process. Interpretations or misinterpretations made by audiences can have massive cultural rippling effects that positively or negatively transform an author's intended message. For example, Matt Fury created Pepe the Frog for his graphic novel Boys Club. He intended Pepe to be a little brother-like character out of a friend group. His character was co-opted from its comic context to become a meme and then a hate symbol, and all of this landed him on a database of hate crime-related imagery through no fault of his own. The Beginner's Guide and Outsider Art present us with this problem. How much are our interactions with art mediated by our own experiences and biases? It should make us wonder if we are able to be self-aware enough to set aside our own prejudices when viewing works by people whose experiences are outside our own. There are plenty of instances of outsider artists that didn't make artwork to be seen or couldn't express otherwise, like Vivian Meyer and Henry Darger, and these figures should make us ask ourselves, should we look at and interpret someone's work when they probably didn't want us to? Is looking at the artwork of disabled people a form of voyeurism? It can be. I built Marwin Call for me, for my therapy. And now it's like everybody's. <laughs> like everybody wants to, everybody wants to play in it or be part of it and everything. And I don't want all that. It, it's like this is the one last thing that I don't ever want taken from me. And it, it seems like it is, but theoretically it's not. It's still mine. It's still mine. Art critic Ian Patel writes in his article, Outside Looking In. Exhibitions of marginal artwork are fundamentally different from mainstream art exhibitions. They demand a duty of care. Viewing art isn't a passive activity. We actively construct frameworks and meanings that then change the opinions of others, maybe even without them noticing. Outsider art is a category of art, a construction that makes assumptions about those who have been compartmentalized, spreading them academically in order to justify cultural myths for collectors and institutions to earn wealth and recognition. We should be wary of labels like these, taking care to ask who benefits. The work produced by disabled artists deserves to be shown alongside work created by all other types of artists. This artwork should be celebrated for its unique artistic choices and rationale, just as anyone else's work is. Disabled people share the same space with everyone else, and their insights and contributions should be afforded the same considerations, including privacy. Their participation in the art world is both personal and professional, and it serves to disrupt the neurotypical bias that invisibly permeates all aspects of life. The idea of the outsider artist makes the perceived uselessness of a person useful, but this way of thinking is reductive and it really only serves to create avenues to generate capital and notoriety for its discovery. Art by disabled people is not a genre, it's just art.